I'm Mort Cooper, your host on Change Your Voice, Change Your Life. In studio with me is Dr. John Curtis, a nationally syndicated writer, and he's also uh, the co-author of a book with me. What is the title of the book, Dr. Curtis? I think it's Curing Hopeless Voices. And what's the rest of it? Spasmodic dysphonia. Well, this is about this the is strangled about, voice. This is about killing the cure. That's what we're talking about today. What's the topic? Killing the cure. That's the topic you came up with. Yeah. You're very you're very uh, creative. In, well, the in cure has become a dirty word today in your field. They don't want to hear about cures. Well, they, they hear about it, but what do they do? The history of medicine, I mean, is always like a search for a cure. Mm -hmm. But now that they found a cure, mm -hmm. I mean, and, I mean, you're like a good doctor that comes around with a cure that'll work. Mm -hmm. And now they've accused you of being a witch doctor. Why is that? Well, I've only been reporting cures for over 35 years in the number one handbook, uh, Speech Pathology and Audiology, back in 1971. I've been to the California Speech and Hearing Association dating 1970 reporting cures, the American Speech and Hearing Association 1974, 1979, 1980, and as recently as 2000 reporting cures. I have peer review of cures in 1980 in the International Association of Logopedics and Phoniatrics. I've been reporting cures. I have a DVD of cures. Uh, we play it. Uh, you can get it, a two-hour version of it. We have a seven-and-a-half-minute version. You may see it today if we have time. So I've been reporting cures. I'm the enemy of the medical people. Well, what's ironic is that uh, the professions have changed today, medical professions. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just at a continuing education conference that was sponsored by a, a drug company named Pfizer. Mm -hmm. It's a very large publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. It was very lavish. We were really quite impressed with mm -hmm. um, coffee, tea, fruit, cut up fruit. They provide the best. Oh, this was a lavish spread. Yeah, it usually is. Oh, this was. They this know was, how to spend this money. This was well done. Companies. And um, somebody was telling me in there that, isn't this wonderful? I mean, look at this spread here. Mm -hmm. And then the presenter proceeded to talk about a variety of medications for mm -hmm. treating. This was focused on mental illness mainly. Mm -hmm. But he acted as if these medications were like candy or mm -hmm. vitamins. Or, the public or, thinks they are. Well, you could just take a medication and there's no consequence mm -hmm. to, the, to the body. Well, that's the impression it. given the public. Well, why, why, they, why does this surprise you? But why, why, does it, it's a, why is it in your field when they came up with Botox, botulinum mm -hmm. toxin? I mean, literally one of the most deadly poisons known to man. In fact, the company Allergan Inc. that makes Botox, mm -hmm. they purchased the entire weapons-grade supply of mm -hmm. botulinum toxin uh, from the U.S. Army when the chemical weapons ban went into effect. Mm -hmm. And they began their company by per making that purchase of a deadly nerve toxin mm -hmm. and developed it into a, uh, a, a medical treatment mm -hmm. for various conditions. Of course, in your field, it's for the strangled voice. Mm -hmm. So why is it that, that they market this drug as a natural purified protein like a health food? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because it sells. <laughs> a natural health food sells. Whole food sells. But it's not a health food. We're well, that, talking about injecting somebody with one of the deadliest toxins known to man. And I know in the in diluted form, yes. not in the original. In the original state, it's considered one of the deadliest poisons, if if not the deadliest poison. But they're diluting it. I believe that the U.S. went to war against Saddam Hussein, if I'm not mm. mistaken, because they said he had 500,000 liters mm. of botulinum toxin. That was one of the nerve agents he had. Mm -hmm. A weapon of mass destruction. Uh, that is a very problematic uh, uh, condition. Uh, do you know, folks, that a thumbnail of undiluted botulinum toxin can kill 100 to 200,000 people in the few minutes I've read? Now, I think it's very, I want you to explain to me, you treat a variety of pa patients that have uh, mm -hmm. received Botox uh, treatment, and mm -hmm. these patients, and I've talked to some of them, mm -hmm. are extremely scrupulous people, mm -hmm. very almost um, paranoid about toxins in the water supply. They mm -hmm. usually come in with bottles of water mm -hmm. that they get, they're filtered you, bottles. You like irony. They, they, won't, they won't drink out of the tap because they're so, afraid of being poisoned. You, you see the irony of it, but they're going to have Botox. No, they, they've, they've received Botox. Yes, they have. Sometimes they have, repeated up to 100 shots. No, not 100. No, they don't go up to that. They go, the most I've ever heard uh, of Red, and probably there are more, but they, the, the most I've ever heard is 50 Botox shots. And I spoke with a fellow who had uh, 50 Botox shots and had no voice. He lost his job as well. 
but I've never heard more than 50, but apparently there could be. Uh, nobody knows. Well, why are they so concerned about toxins in water that they would drink out of a tap, but they're not concerned about toxins that are being injected by their physicians a in disconnect. a white jacket? There's a disconnect, and they trust their physicians. Well, words, they should. Who else are you going to trust? Well, how about your you, body? Don't you think that Groucho Marx said, do you believe me or your own eyes? Why would a patient undergo Botox treatment, mm. 45 shots or however many shots they got over mm. a numerous year period, mm -hmm. several years, mm -hmm. and not question that, but they come into your treatment and then in, in two days or three days they're questioning what you're doing. Why don't they cut you some slack? Because they believe in what is. They trust the establishment. They trust the status quo. They're well-intentioned. What I'm doing is telling them they're misusing their voice. They're causing the problem called spasmodic dysphonia. And that is not a neurological problem. It's not a psychiatric problem, per se. It's caused by misuse of the voice. And, and that is a... And I showed them how to use the voice. A stunning So you're changing a personality. What is your comment? No, I mean, I think it's a stunning... Uh, uh, it's a shock when you tell them mm -hmm. they don't have a neuromuscular disease. Why are they so surprised about that? Because I'm not wearing a white jacket. And when I did wear a white jacket, which was told that I wear it at UCLA when I was on the staff and faculty, uh, patients believe me more readily than if I don't wear a white jacket when I'm in private practice. So the answer is image. And when you change the person's voice, you're changing their self-identity. You're cha changing their image. And they fight like all heck to avoid that. They want to be their, their old self. They don't realize that they have misused their voice for one reason or another. My take on it is they've been talking wrong for a long, long period of time, or they have had a, a cold or an upper respiratory problem or bronchitis setting off the condition called spasmodic dysphonia. The medical field does not comprehend that misuse of the voice is involved. They believe it's a disease. They believe, believe it's a basal ganglia problem, a deficiency. Uh, they believe that it's uh, a neurological problem, a dystonia. They believe it's genetic. They believe it's molecular, biologically caused. And then there are the crackpots uh, that uh, those who are in the nose and throat uh, field say of the psychiatrist uh, that uh, the condition is psychiatric because the psychiatric uh, people never have a single cure. But then the, in 135 years, but then the answer then to the ear, nose, and throat people is neither have you had a single cure, but they say, they're only uh, new to the field, dating back to 1960 when they believe the study of Roe, Brumlick, and Moore said, and they believe it's documented, it's not, it's suggestive, that uh, the cause of uh, spasmodic dysphonia is neurological based, but it's not. It can't be because I can't cure a neurological problem. Well, I know that you know, the, the uh, leading researcher at the National Institutes of Health, her name is Dr. Christy Ludlow. Mm. Um, I asked her a very simple question. Mm. And it, was, it wasn't complicated, really. It was mm. a, you know, we, uh, as a journalist, I wanted to. I asked her, Dr. Ludlow, could you please tell me whether you've received any compensation, money, stock options, any kind of remuneration of any kind over the mm. last 15 years mm. from Allergan Inc., the maker of Botox? I mm. said, so it's not illegal. Your uh, mm. uh, director of the mm. National Institutes of Health allows uh, researchers to have dual relationships with pharmaceutical companies. Can you tell me whether you've received any remuneration of any kind from Botox, mm -hmm. uh, from Allergan, the maker of Botox? And she said, she said to me, she said, I can't answer your question. And she said to me, I, I said, why? It's a, it's a yes or no question. You either have or you haven't. Can you just answer it yes or no? No, I can't answer you. You'll need to talk to the Freedom of Information Officer mm -hmm. at the National Institutes of Health. Mm -hmm. And you know what, after an extensive uh, investigation where they actually put, went through the steps, mm -hmm. the motion, they produced some documents. And you know what the documents were? They were letters from um, individuals who had participated mm -hmm. in letters by her, Dr. Ludlow, to individuals who had participated in some workshops that she had put on that were sponsored by the drug maker Allergan, mm -hmm. okay, that thanked them for participating. Mm -hmm. The question I asked her was whether she received any money. Mm -hmm. Th those are the documents that under Freedom of she Information... She doesn't want to answer your question. That's Dr. Curtis, people want to keep their privacy. I would like to know how many people giving Botox shots to, to uh, their patients 
on Allegan stock. Uh, it's just a question I have. I, I, I uh, haven't voiced it, but it, it is entered my mind. There are only 200 uh, uh, ear, nose, and throat doctors and some uh, neurologists giving Botox shots, only 200 of 14,300 ear, nose, and throat doctors. So it's a question that uh, has popped into my mind. But let's take a look and see what uh, the, uh, the uh, situation is when we look at a DVD. It's a short one on cures of spasmodic dysphonia. What is the title of this program? It's Killing the Cure. Yeah, uh, My Field Kills the Cures. Let's take a look, and t uh, look at uh, cures of spasmodic dysphonia. Thank you. And I took a round of antibiotics, and then they put me on a stronger antibiotic, and I took that. And it's, I've, I began to feel good, but the voice has been a mess ever since. I'm commissioned sales at Sears, and that's my livelihood, is my voice. I got so depressed just not being able to talk that it definitely affected my life. This voice was coming, I just, you know, I said, God damn it! Within a month of uh, therapy with Dr. Cooper, I was using my voice again to the extent that I could go out on interviews and auditions and shortly thereafter actually worked. You can hear the obstruction starting to obstruct now, I think. This is the new voice. There is that aspect of lightening up, but there also is an aspect of having the correct pressurization. And he said, mm, I don't want you to talk in that little girl's voice anymore. You talk in your regular voice. <laughs> I said, but when I talk in my regular voice, you can't understand what I'm saying. I had a strangled voice. It was very difficult to speak. Uh, when I did speak, it, um, was, it sounded strangled. Before I had, learned, had worked into the position of employment director, manager of employment, and he continued to make overtures. Day to pick her up before too late and take her home. Do I feel that I'm likely to go back to it? No, I don't. And he says, well, Ron, I'll give you three options, too. He says, well, you can continue coming here for shots. Um, you can call that doctor in California to schedule a surgery if you'd like. And then he goes, oh, oh yeah, by the way, Ron, uh, there's also this other guy. Go to his website, and he wrote down his name, thevoicedoctor.com, uh, and handed it to him. And he says, check out this guy. He says he has a cure. And uh, so I found on the dystonia page that something that plagued people with focal dystonia was very often spasmodic dysphonia. And they called it, you know, multifocal dystonia. And I, as a patient who has experienced the fear mm -hmm. and agony of thinking that my voice is disappearing. It just got really bad lately. Uh, it chokes up. My voice chokes up. I can't breathe. I feel like I'm running out of air. I didn't think that it could be so simple, but it was. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. Gradually through a period of a year, it kept getting progressively worse where, where um, within a matter of days it would occur. This is the patient's recovered voice. And then I'd go in and start talking to my boss, and at the end of like a sentence, I could it would start dropping, and he'd say, "What's wrong with What's wrong with your voice?" And I'd say, "I don't know." I thought, "What's happened? What have, What have I done to myself? I know no one out there has this horrible problem I've got, but I found out there's an awful lot of people walking around out there in this world that have the spastic dysphonia." And they say it's because some. Um motor signal from the brain is overamped and it tightens up the vocal cords. It's pretty tragic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Pretty tragic sound and it's quite different now. The last time um, he injected me with um, half a unit each in Botox, I completely lost my voice for six weeks. I was incapacitated. It was a complete roller coaster going through that, mm. you know, but that's the only treatment that they told me was available and that I would be getting these injections for the rest of my life. Couldn't think of any name, and my sister and I were joking around about how many people call the rabbits caught 
tail, and I just said, oh yeah, wouldn't that be funny if I called it Q-tip? So we just called it Q-tip. Can you talk with the rabbit again? Hi, Q-tip, how are you? Do you want to hop around today? Um, are you thirsty? Why did you bite my shoe? Do you realize you change your voice when you talk to the rabbit? Yes. I talk higher. Who diagnosed it? Um, Scripps, Scripps Hospital in La Jolla. Probably about, probably about a year and a half ago. Mm, they told me that it was neurological and I was born with it. Other than the one time from Bryn where I had six months good voice, nothing. I believe that um, spasmodic dysphonia is curable. According to legend, a boiling pot of gold at one end. People look, but no one ever finds it. I've been here for the past 10 days trying to find a job, uh, teaching position for the next academic year. Jack They didn't know what to do because they couldn't get me out of it. So eventually I went to other doctors who told me I had spasmodic dysphonia. Trying to get help is very difficult because you can't communicate the problem or just your trials. They want you to go to psychiatrists. And how are you supposed to go to a psychiatrist when you can't speak? Well, and then he says, well, how long ago did you see Dr. Cooper? And I went, oh, my God, it's been six years. It'll be six years in June. Well, as I go through the day, uh, right now, I, I'm tending to raise my voice and go into the upper register. Do you remember that voice? I remember it. Did you like it? <laughs> I didn't like it then. didn't like it now. That's to help. And after a while, I eat my voice. Not a hundred percent, but much better than it had been. And after about two years, it started to again go oh, worse and worse. I hope that by sharing, others too will find new hope for a, a life that allows them that greatest gift that God has given us, the gift that makes us human, that gift we call communication. About the We're back in studio. Dr. John Curtis is always surprised at what I tell him, what's going on. I think uh, a nationally syndicated writer, he's always um, boggled of mine, and he has a great mind, but he's boggled hearing but what the, I tell him. But, you know, one of the things is that physicians and the drug company, uh, Allergan, claims that, that this treatment is 99% effective. Well, the medical people have claimed that. So wh why is it that if it's 99% effective, you've got people reporting to you that maybe one out of 30 or one out of 45, 45 or, shots worked? Or 50. That doesn't or sound like 99%. Or 19. Because, that sounds like 2%. But the statement is, is valid in this uh, sense, and that's, that's where it's uh, misleading to the public. Uh, they put in Botox, botulinum toxin, Bo for botulinum and tox for toxin. It's, uh, you know it, it paralyzes uh, muscles. It's used for faces, but it's used in a different context. For the voice they're maintaining, it's a neurological problem. So the face is a, a, a problem where they don't have to do anything for themselves. With, with a spasmodic dysphonia, they're misusing the voice. It's not a neurological problem from uh, my experience of over 35 years dealing with this problem and helping to cure it. Why do they say in medicine that's 99% effective? Because when they Botox, botulinum toxin, the vocal cords, <coughs> what happens is they paralyze the vocal cords, paralyze. So the spasms which occur in nearly all the patients, not all, nearly all, are paralyzed, therefore the spasms stop. Therefore, in that context, Botox is 99% effective. But, but now about the voice. Does it return the voice? No, it doesn't. To a normal, uh, no. clear sounding no, voice? No, basically not. And there's a roller coaster ride, and the voice goes out, and the spasms come back. You get a Botox shot, the voice goes out, the spasms uh, are gone for a short while. You have a voice. If you have a good voice or a normal voice, you're lucky. It's usually a, a, uh, uh, a partial voice. And at those times when it's effective for you with Botox, I tell patients, just go on if you're happy with it. 
I don't, I'm not opposed to Botox for, for spasmodic dysphonia if it works for you, but I think there's a need for choice because patients who take Botox shots and get no effects, no results, and uh, no give back should uh, be allowed choice, and they're not allowed choice. That's the, the whole issue of what I'm talking about. Not that Botox should be stopped or that surgery should not be done, but that the patients with spasmodic dysphonia should know that there are cures by another modality, another approach called direct voice revoltation, all natural by what I've done, and that these uh, uh, cures are documented. Now, one of the things that I think that you do that I think is somewhat novel in your industry mm -hmm. is that you actually listen to the patient's voice. Yes, I'm, I'm tuned to the voice. Uh, the ear, the clinical ear is key to helping those with the, a voice problem of any kind so, to improve and to cure their condition. So is it very complicated and a long, uh, extensive process to diagnose SD? No, it takes about three to five seconds on a slow day, especially on the phone, you can hear it. Herb Dito up in San Francisco, a famed ear, nose, and throat doctor, says it's, it's quick. You just listen to them on the phone. But what's ironical is that uh, people diagnosing SD don't subject their SD patients, if they think it's SD, to calling in and talking with them by phone or using a phone in the office. Why do they typically put, put the patient through a very long, extensive uh, phonatory and uh, fiber optic sort of analysis to ascertain the diagnosis of because SD the, the, when it can be obtained in a matter of seconds. Because the ear, nose, and throat doctors are not clinically trained, clinically trained to listen to voices, so they don't they don't know what to listen for, and speech pathologists also lack uh, the clinical ear, basically, from my experience with them. So, my understanding. So they don't know how to. Uh, they don't know what to listen for. But in the analysis that they're doing, and you know, there, there's certain individuals like. Bruce Garrett mm -hmm. at UCLA or Michael Rolnick mm -hmm. who are specialized mm -hmm. in looking at vocal cords. Mm -hmm. What is the value of looking at a vocal cord rather than listening to the voice? Uh, they have their own modality and their own uh, aspect of what uh, is important. Uh, the medical field, as you know, uh, you're the co-author of what is the title of our book? It's Curing Hopeless Voices. And what's the rest of the presentation? the strangled voice, spasmodic dysphonia. Well, it's about the strangled voice. We discussed the fact that the medical people are trained to look at vocal cords, not listen to vocal cords, because they're not interested in developing their own clinical ear to decide what is wrong with the voice. That is what I'm doing. But That's what's separating that me from them. Isn't that almost the equivalent of going to an ophthalmologist and having him listen to your eyeball? How do you listen, how do you diagnose a visual problem by listening to an eyeball? Mm -hmm. But isn't that what they're really doing in the field of e ENT or audiology? What value is there to looking at a vocal cord when you can listen to the voice and tell? And I've said this to Dr. Ludlow. Mm -hmm. I, she said to me, your methodology, Dr. Cooper's methodology mm -hmm. is unsound. Who is it's Dr. not scientific. Christy Ludlow? She's the uh, chairperson of head and neck or vocal. Well, at, at the National Institutes of Health. She's yeah. a leading researcher yeah. in the field. And she says there are no neurological diseases. Dysphonia, it's a, a neurological but, problem. But here's, here's, mm -hmm. the, here's the point. You wouldn't go to your ophthalmologist and have him listen to your eyeball. Mm -hmm. Why do they go to a person with a voice disorder and look at the voice? The, looking at the voice, it's a non sequitur. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to the voice right. to determine the before and after. And I told Dr. Ludlow, Dr. Cooper has before... Uh, uh, reproductions of the voice that are done, he didn't make them up, they're done with voice recordings, and he's got after treatment mm -hmm. voice recordings. Well, we heard today. Yes. Isn't that the best method in the, in the area of voice? He says, no, you must look at the voice. I said, Where, what is it about these people that think that they're going to find something looking at the voice? They can't find anything. There's nothing wrong with the vocal cords. She said that they, they're, they're now looking at the brains of yes, patients with this. The next step is they, they want to do brain surgery, I fear. But they're on the wrong road. They're well-intentioned, they're humane, uh, they're conscientious. They're on the wrong road. And I said on a previous program, in, 19, uh, in 1345, uh, when the rage of the Black Plague was about, uh, the French king asked his three leading physicians to tell him what the cause of the Black Plague was. Do you know the story now? Do you want to yeah, tell no, it? Yeah, I, I, I know. It's something about the alignment of the stars. No, no. He asked them to tell him what was the cause of the Black Plague, and they said, my liege, may I retire? And uh, the king granted their request. They came back and told him, 
the cause of the Black Plague that had killed 25 million people at that time in Western Europe was due to the fact that the stars were coming together in the galaxy. Now, it wasn't until 1900, approximately, that two French physicians in the Louis Pasteur Institute in Paris figured out the rats had done it. Now, it only took them 550 years to figure out what the medical cause of the Black Plague was. Only 550. Medic the medical community today does not have one single cure in medicine dating back to 1871 by Ludwig Trog, who first described spasmodic dysphonia as nervous hoarseness. They've never had one single cure of the spasmodic dysphonic condition in medicine since that time. What does that say about the medical community? Are they back at the point where the French king is asking his three leading physicians what the cause of the Black Plague is? Now, I have on file an innocent throat doctor, a well-known doctor, who wrote a prescription to a person who had spasmodic dysphonia, chew on a golf ball. Today's therapy uh, is out to lunch, in my opinion. They're telling them to drink lots of water. That's the cause of spasmodic dysphonia. Water, if you drink, you, you cannot touch the vocal cords. You're on the floor coughing in spasm. What is water to do with the cause of spasmodic dysphonia? I have no idea. They tell them to talk on H words. Talk on well, H words. I've often wondered why that. You hear people who are having trouble with their voice or they're mm -hmm. coughing up phlegm, mm -hmm. and then they're told to drink water. Mm -hmm. But isn't it true that the vocal cords are hermetically sealed That's from, right. from the esophagus? It's, it, 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 so it, it, why is it that the it's water not that, is that the water going down to the level of the vocal cords would get you in spasms. I'm Mort Cooper. What is the title of this program? This is Killing the Cure. Yes, I report cures so they, they uh, make me the enemy of the people. I hope I'm not. Thank you very much for joining with me. Your name is? John Curtis. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. John, this whole thing doesn't add up. I think up. it's so funny that they're that when I asked Ludlow, I said, "Why are you? Why do you believe that his methodology is unsound? Mm -hmm. What value is there to looking at the vocal cords?" They are taken with high tech. High tech does not cure spasmodic dysphonia. It has never cured spasmodic dysphonia. We talk about that in the book. The public is unaware. The medical community is unaware. And. The problem is that they're on the wrong road. Okay. Yeah, okay, I know we're still on here. Yeah, but the, you know, the thing is that, that, that's so troubling is you can't look at a vocal cord and, and, and infer from that somebody's voice. They're on the listen. wrong road. Forget about looking at vocal cords. They're not listening. They're not trained. The problem.